Welcome to the Naturally Nourished Podcast that delivers cutting-edge food as medicine solutions for optimal health. Allie Miller is a nutrition expert sought up by the media and America's top medical institutes for her revolutionary functional medicine interventions. From disease treatment to prevention, every episode will empower you with ways to put yourself back in control of your health. Please note, the topics discussed are for educational purposes only. Now welcome, Integrative Dietitians Allie Miller and her co-host Becky Yu. Welcome to the Naturally Nourished Podcast. This week in episode 209, we will be covering Allie's CGM experiment. For those of you who don't know what that is, that's continuous glucose monitor, where she wore a meter to track her blood sugar for 12 days straight. So we'll cover kind of a real life detailed approach to how stress, diet, supplements, and other lifestyle factors impact Allie's blood sugar and where this could be hindering your wellness and weight loss goals. Yes, I cannot wait to share everything I've learned with you guys. I really thought it was an empowering tool. A lot of the things that I speak to and I've seen with a glucometer and a ketone meter, I of course saw repeated in trends, but usually I'm kind of cherry picking that data. You know, I'm either doing it at a fasting read or making a tweak with exercise and not always sticking myself more than four times a day. (laughs) Totally. Yes. So this was really cool. And I definitely saw trends and aha moments that many clients could benefit from. So for those of you that don't know, a CGM, as Becky said, is a continuous glucose meter or monitor, and uh, it is a device that you put in a part of your back of your arm where it's a little bit higher fat, and it uh, stays in for upwards of two weeks, and it is tracking your blood sugar continuously. So there's no cherry picking. You can see your trends while you're sleeping. You can see the variances of a deep restful sleep versus a poor night of sleep. You can see the influence of, like Becky said, stress, supplement adjustments, fluctuations in intake. So whether I'm fasting for a longer period of time within a day, eating more or less carbs, and how that's impacting metabolic flexibility. I was totally surprised at certain factors that I knew would impact blood sugar, but not to the level of the evidence that I saw. And I think it's going to be an awesome episode to empower you all and teach you about the access of this device, which you could try to take your health and blood sugar management to the next level. Yes. Super, super cool. And I shared in my second trimester episode doing my four point glucose tolerance um, test to opt out of the oral glucose test. Um, That was episode 196, but I think having a CGM would have been like so much more pleasant than, like you said, sticking your finger four times a day and, and gives really cool data. So I definitely think I'll have to play with one kind of once I get things reset with the baby and feeding patterns and just kind of recalibration of my body and hopefully getting back into keto. Um, And I can't wait to hear more about your experience. But before we do that, let's just have a quick word from our opening sponsor, Wild Foods. Yes. Wild Foods is a company that puts quality, sustainability, and health first in all of their products. They believe, just like us, that food is medicine and that all starts with quality sourcing. So they painstakingly source from small farms around the globe, and their mission is to seriously fix the broken food system. They have partnered with us to give you guys an exclusive discount when you use the code AllieMillerRD on your order over at wildfoods.co, that's .co, not .com. When you put in AllieMillerRD at checkout, you will save 12% off. Off your order and they offer everything from coffee to our favorite matcha to carefully selected hand harvested whole vanilla beans which Becky has mused on in past episodes yes. it's changing our life because there's no alcohol taste and so you can put the uh, just a pinch of that vanilla bean in your coffee with like a I'm, I'm right now doing some raw um, cream from a local A2 dairy and I'm just doing a pinch of that vanilla bean in there with some collagen and it is next 
level <laughs> amazing. So you're actually getting the antioxidants and that aromatic flavor profile. Uh, they also have wild cacao butter, which is an awesome dairy-free fat. So if you're using a fat-boosted fast and you don't do well with ghee or grass-fed uh, dairy, then you could use the cacao butter wafers. And some people don't do well with the coconut oil, so that would be another coconut and dairy-free option of fat and provides a nice, robust kind of chocolatey flavor. I love all of their tea blends. One of my favorites is the Thai G, which is a green rooibos with ginger, lemongrass, and lime. Also pretty obsessed with their Twilight Black Tea. And as I've talked about in past episodes, teas are fantastic because they're going to provide a great boost of antioxidants, compounds that are going to reduce inflammation in your body, enhance your immune system, as well as aid in body fat burn. And the last product I have to mention is their adaptogens. So they have mushroom blends, just like their tea blends by numerical order. A bunch of different profiles so they have things like lion's mane on its own and reishi mushroom they have chaga but they have an awesome product that has raw cacao raw maca wild foraged turmeric and then also the chaga and reishi mushroom extracts and it's called cocotropic uh, it's an awesome way to support cognitive enhancement as well as mood stability and relaxation so you're providing that concentration and focus without that stressed and wired mode um, and it's the balance of the synergy of all of those compounds so go on over and check out wildfoods.co check out all of their pantry staples their food is medicine in the forms of teas mushrooms Room extracts, coffee, and so much more, and use the code Allie Miller RD at checkout to save 12% on your first order. I just used their Cocotropic blend in some popsicles that I made this weekend with Ooh. full fat coconut milk. They were delicious. That sounds <laughs> amazing. Yes. Yep. Anywhere that you use cacao powder, I feel like it's a good sub. Yeah, for sure. Upgrade. Because I thought it was shocking when I first tried it that you can't really taste the turmeric. Because right. at first I was like, what? How is that going to play? And the funny thing is, I think maca itself tastes pretty gnarly. And so I love that the synergy with the mushrooms and the maca and the turmeric and the cacao, you get that robust cacao flavor, but you definitely can notice the difference in your mental health. Yes, totally. All right. So first question on the topic of CGMs, and I think let's just get this one out of the way because I had this question and I'm sure a lot of other people do too. Did the CGM hurt to put on and how annoying was it to wear for that 12 days? Yeah. So I used a NutriSense CGM and that's actually our sponsor for today's episode. So we'll talk more about the company in the middle of this episode, but uh, NutriSense is really the app and the CGM that I used is they still use the Freestyle Libre. And so that's the device itself and you know the most known um, in the medical field and typically this is used for type 1 diabetics so that they can correspond with their insulin pump and have more flexibility throughout the day and have this constant monitoring uh, to better manage their blood sugar so that's the way CGMs have you know come into the market and the thing that's interesting is they really have just started to enter into the health space because companies like NutriSense are working with the accessibility without a prescription because these would require a prescription you can't just buy them at Walgreens or CVS like you can a glucometer or you know like your ketone meters that you can get online at this time so um, I was a little intimidated by the process because I was like oh my gosh so this like thing is gonna stay on my arm I'm becoming like a cyborg <laughs> and you guys know I'm really anti I I'm I'm especially with the idea of like EMF I'm not into wearing Apple watches I'm not into like trackers <laughs> for many reasons but definitely the idea of the the EMF connection and so I, I did not feel any um, neurological impact of wearing it I will say putting it on it has like a spring mechanism um, kind of like a lancet does when you're sticking your finger um, but the spring mechanism also has a really strong adhesive on the sensor and so you just kind of it looks like a stamp kind of device you hold it up to the back of your arm and you just press on it with pressure it really didn't hurt at all um, I think it honestly hurt less than um, finger pricks mm -hmm. so and especially when you're doing a finger prick like you said Becky four times a day and trying to rotate you yeah, know you it, run out of fingers I know <laughs> you try to do the side of your nail bed but you, you really have really sensitive nerve endings in your fingertips mm -hmm. comparatively to the back of your arm yep and I watched you put it on it didn't 
I think I was more scared than you were. Um, I know. At it, first, it didn't I thought, look like it hurt at all. At first, I thought I was going to need Becky to do it because I was like, I don't know if I can <laughs> assert the pressure. And then I just muscled up and did it. I actually did it on my Instagram stories, so I'll, I'll highlight that somewhere here. And um, yeah, so I would say pretty painless, um, you know, less than a pinch. And it was uh, very adhesive. It did start to loosen around like day 10. Um, and I did swim twice with it. I, uh, of course, didn't submerge it. The idea with swimming was you can't submerge it under three feet of water. So I couldn't like dive in and stay underwater. Um, it can get wet because I was showering with it, of course, regularly. But they state to not submerge deep and also to just be mindful of the constant water influence. So I kind of sat with my arm out of the pool the, the days I was swimming um, and didn't do a lot of swimming, more kind of just like pool soaking. Um, I will say I had one day on like maybe day four of wearing it where my shirt got caught on it and I also ran it into the wall a couple times. <laughs> like door, you know, it, it's not that thick. It's probably no. like a, what, like a eight, maybe a little bit wider than an eighth of an inch. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, just that little extra space that you don't account for when you turn through a doorway. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> nicking it a couple times that that was the the time that I pulled it on my shirt was the most painful but oh, all in all totally doable and other than that I saw Stella like trying to be like can we take this off yeah mama it probably annoyed her more than it annoyed you oh every morning she'd be <laughs> like can I touch it gentle and I'd be like yes and then she'd be like is this gentle tap 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 and I'd be like um no that's a little intense just a gentle tap uh so she was really intrigued by it for sure yeah Okay. And then the coolest part about a CGM, like you said, is that you're not cherry picking when you're collecting your data points. So, you know, with uh, finger pricks, we might, you know, do, like you said, a fasted score or um, look at it first thing in the morning or when we think we're doing really well blood sugar wise to kind of collect that data. Or maybe you collect when you're feeling a little bit off. Um, But with a CGM, you can really watch the patterns and the trends of your body. So let's just dig in and and start there with what patterns you saw and um, maybe in doing so also hit kind of the classic times that we would normally assess blood sugar. Yeah, I think that that's the coolest part about it. And and what I really enjoyed nerding out on is connecting the dots of how I feel with said glucose levels. Um, So I was pretty shocked that I had no, well, I wasn't shocked. I, I had no episodes of blood sugar lows in a symptom wise, but I was riding in the sixties more often than I have seen with a glucometer. Mm -hmm. Um, so I thought that that was interesting and, um, definitely we'll, we'll talk about the impact of what the highest brought, but let's open with maybe fasting glucose and what that is. So fasting glucose is at least eight hours without food. Generally I say 12 hours And what we're looking at in the fasting window is the influence of the dawn phenomenon or basically the influence of your waking cortisol levels and how that's impacting your blood sugar. Because as we've discussed in past episodes, you know, cortisol is a glucocorticoid or a steroidal hormone that does influence your blood sugar. And so when we do see a a rise in the fasting blood sugar, we can look at either the liver through gluconeogenesis didn't manage blood sugar appropriately while sleeping, or that cortisol stress hormone is peaking too high or too reactive and that's getting a blood sugar spike. So generally we want a fasting blood sugar between 70 to 90. And um, if we see it higher than that, we like to investigate, you know, how the liver's managing sugar as well as the cortisol connection. Now, when someone is in a state of nutritional ketosis, such as myself, I was in keto the whole way through, um, even though you guys will be shocked to hear what I was eating. Um, But, uh, well, maybe not those of you that have been in my 12-week virtual (laughs) food is medicine keto class, but those of you that are, you know, keto policers, uh, you know, it's interesting to see the metabolic flexibility that I had. Um, but the, the rising blood sugar levels were, were definitely more closer to the upper range in my body when compared to the postprandial or after meal ranges, which speaks to in my body, the stress response, because when you are in a state of nutritional ketosis, you're less relying on that gluconeogenesis influence of the liver while you're sleeping, regulating your blood sugar, because your body's able to use ketones as you're sleeping. Um, my fasting range was from 86 to 99. So um, definitely had some areas that were higher than that 70 to 90 ideal. Um, But I do know because I tested my adrenals back in May 
which when I did this experiment in August, you know, not that far down, my epinephrine back in May was 11 Mm -hmm. and um, it's supposed to be between two to five. So, you know, more than double the reference range. And my, my peak rise cortisol was not high, but it was in the highest level of normal. Um, so I do know that my cortisol levels are off and, um, my sleeping range was from 60 to 92. Um, so it seemed like blood sugar was, you know, overall pretty regulated at a very low level. My average blood glucose overall throughout the day within the 24 hour periods and the 12 days of wearing was 85. And I had, you know, 0% spikes outside of the ideal range per day. Um, so because the, the tight range is a hundred, so I didn't have a, a, a fasting glucose above a hundred, um, which kept me at that 0% of spikes. Got it. And that's an area we often have to troubleshoot within our keto program is that fasting glucose being elevated and not seeing ketone production first thing in the morning. And, and we talk a lot about that dawn phenomenon with cortisol. Yes. And, you know, I have to be honest because I am a mama and with everything post pandemic, I believe of the 12 uh, mornings of where Stella was in our bed, at least 10 of those, if not Mm -hmm. 11. Um, And I do know that I sleep poor quality sleep, but it's just not something that I'm willing to deal with in the sense of like, you know, getting her out of my bed. I think the cost to benefit of having her body by me during this time of still questionable stress and changes in her emotions is, is worth her being there. Um, but I could definitely see on the nights that I had poorer sleep that the blood sugar would respond accordingly. And, um, I also saw when I, I did, I don't always take calm and clear at bed. And that's interesting. I always have been taking through February to date, a sleep support at bed because the sleep support, each tablet has 1.5 milligrams of melatonin. It also has that skull cap and other traditional Chinese herbs, which are supportive against um, COVID. So I've been doing sleep support every night. I've been doing a scoop and a half of relax and regulate, but I did notice after day eight of my fasting blood sugar, I started to take two calm and clear at bed and that phosphatidylserine in there did play a role with reducing my blood sugar fasted. So I definitely noticed that as an influential trend. Super interesting. And that's the cool thing about wearing one of these is that you can kind of tweak as you go and and see what impacts it. Most definitely. Okay. And then what about um, what you noticed in terms of postprandial or after eating glucose values? Yes. So for the postprandial ranges, we really like these to be less than 140. Um, And after two to three hours of eating, you want to see them back to your pre-meal value. Um, For a controlled diabetic, we say at the two-hour window, we want them to be under uh, 140. But for a non-diabetic, we want them to be in the two-hour window under 120, but the one hour window, they could be higher. Um, and so my postprandial value values were rated as excellent. Um, the highest postprandial read was 129. And that was at the one hour mark, not the two hour mark. And I will say I was really playing as an experiment with where things were at. And I had a, um, grass fed burger patty, no bun, but I did have like a probably a full cup, at least two thirds cup of a mix of sweet potato and Yukon gold potato fries, which is very unlikely. Um, you know, maybe I do that a couple times a year. And then, um, I also (laughs) had like eight to 10 ounces of a coffee milkshake, which was not at all, um, (laughs) low carb. You know, I think I, I would have at least hypothesized that that meal, I had upwards of like 80 to 90 grams of carbs. Um, so I really wanted to see how my body responded almost like a glucose tolerance test and was happy to see that that postprandial was there. Most of my meals um, really very rarely went over 110 in the blood sugar, even at that one hour mark, which means the two hour mark was back well in the 90s. Yes, and I know that's definitely not a typical day. So definitely pushing, I just wanted to pushing see. your limits. And I think you were <laughs> carb cycling at the same time. So I was, and usually my carb cycling is super clean paleo, but I hadn't seen any influx other than stress, which we'll get to in a moment. And so I was like, um, let's, let's give it a try yep. Brady. <laughs> and so we did it. He was like, shocked. Who is this one? <laughs> I know he was like, yeah, we were literally like laying in bed, sipping a milkshake. And he's like, um, are you okay? <laughs> 
It's like, it's all for the sake of science. Yeah. Now, to be fair, every time I do carb up or, you know, have a focused intake of carbohydrates, often falling sometime around 19, 20 of my cycle. Uh, I have a lot of episodes out there. One that comes to mind is episode 75 on carb cycling. But to be fair, the impact of my blood sugar was likely supported by my use of berberine boost. Every time I do a carb cycle, I do take two berberine boost at that meal. You know, berberine is an oral hypoglycemic, which basically means that it does lower your blood sugar. It also aids in insulin sensitivity, and it's going to mitigate that influx of a sugar spike feeding unfavorable bacteria or yeast. So by doing so, I'm getting a little bit of a insurance policy, if you will, to aid and assist in the way that my body metabolizes that influx of carbohydrate and breakdown of glucose. And I think that that would have been, in hindsight, a really great experiment to do, (laughs) permission for milkshake twice, I guess, uh, to do it with the berberine boost and without. Uh, But I do feel that the berberine boost always aids in maintaining that metabolic balance. So when carb cycling, something to strongly consider. Um, Let's maybe go through a little bit more on your meals, just walking through a couple of more typical days and maybe running through some of the trends and what you ate. Okay. I think that's a great idea. So I'll just walk you through a couple calendar days. Let's see. Let me pull up my app here. So I'm using the NutriSense app. And honestly, this was a good practice for me in just returning to tracking. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I'm not used to writing down everything that I eat. And so it was pretty fun in that sense because it's a way to be accountable in a really nerdy way because you get that quantitative, like it's really fun to enter a meal and then boop, you just scan your arm and you get to like right away. It's that immediate gratification. Um, so it was, it was an interesting process. So let's see. Um, I'll start with Monday, um, on August 17th. So I rose that day with a fasting glucose of 88. And then I had, uh, my first beverage because I did a fat fast on that day. I had my first beverage, which was a matcha with coconut milk, full fat coconut milk and um, collagen and uh, the blood sugar at that time of having that was at 82 from 88 and then um, the one hour was at 91 the two hour was at uh, 93 and then um, I I was in clinic at Mm -hmm. that time so a random blood sugar at 1238 so I was still fasted had just been sipping on the matcha was 111 at 1238 Meal one, when I quote unquote broke my fast, was at 2.08 p.m. And my blood sugar at the time of having that meal was at 91. And the meal was, let me give it to you. Oh, it was a low carb chocolate chip cookie. Two low carb chocolate chip cookies. That's the ones with the collagen, the gelatin, the eggs, all the stuff. Um, After that consumption, my blood sugar went to 84. So it went from 91. Uh, to 86 to 84 in the, in the one hour and two hour post prandial. Then I had another intake, and that's kind of a random thing for me. I think we had the cookies out, and Brady wasn't there to make me eggs. <laughs> that's what <laughs> happened. So it's like, okay, I'm in clinic. I'll just grab this. Um, then I had on that day a, a dinner of uh, shredded rotisserie chicken on a siete tortilla. So it's an almond flour tortilla with greens, microgreens on top, roasted cauliflower, and avocado. My blood sugar at the time of consumption was 91. Oh, and I also had a glass of wine with that. The blood sugar was at 91, and that was at 6 p.m. Then it went to 94, and then at 8 p.m. it was at 100. And the rest of that evening, I let's see, I had one second glass of wine at 8.30, and the blood sugar was at 94, and then um, probably contributed to my stress mellow out, uh, because then I went from 86 and just hung in the 70s and uh, hit 75 at 11:55 p.m. And then that takes me into the next day. Um, overall, I would say the interesting trend is from 8 p.m. onward is when my blood sugar is the most mellow, mm-hmm. which to me corresponds absolutely with stress. Um, I always am seeing the highest impact with my clinic time of the day. So for instance, the following day, 
Um, I woke up with a fasted blood sugar of, let's see here. Yeah, super interesting. It was that fasting window after your coffee, you were mellow, and then you went the into clinic and kind of pushed the fast a little long mm-hmm. and, and started to trend upward. Yeah, yeah. So I, fa- I woke up with a fasting blood sugar of 96 the following day. Uh, let's see. And then my first uh, intake was yogurt, uh, full fat Greek yogurt with berries and hemp seeds. And that was at 1245, a little earlier than I usually. And that morning I just had water. Uh, and then uh, the blood sugar was at 60 at that time. Uh, it went up to 85 from the consumption of the berries and the yogurt. And that was the two hour postprandial. Then the middle of that day was pretty mellow. I had the dinner meal was pork, uh, butternut squash, acorn squash, tomatoes, cucumbers, greens, a little salad, but two different roasted um, starchy squashes. And I had a total of a cup of combined the two squashes. Um, and I had also two glasses of wine on that night. I didn't want to make any lifestyle changes. So that was a dinner with you guys, actually. Oh, yeah. Dinner with yep. friends. Um, and let's see here. So that was my blood sugar at the time of consumption was 87. The one hour postprandial went to 109. Um, but then the two hour postprandial was back down to 82. So getting total non-diabetic reads when I'm uh, going up with that, you know, one cup of, of starchy mm-hmm. carbs and um, that evening I hit uh, 73 and that kind of ranged from 73 to it looks like 87 um, throughout that evening and I had a couple dips down into the 60s. Um, I think that probably gives people enough of a snapshot. Anything else Becky? No I think pretty cool to see you know how metabolically flexible you are for sure especially with like that cup of, of starch which you know isn't always your typical, like you said, you were trying to push it a little bit on some of those days. Um, and super cool to see also that wine probably, if anything, had a favorable Maybe. impact. I mean, I think that, I think that actually I did a low carb Marg once in there. And I think that that actually did lower my blood sugar, not, not like a dynamic dip drop, but it did lower the blood sugar level. Um, whereas wine just kind of seemed to not influence, Um, I didn't notice a variance in my sleep patterns, for instance, um, but I didn't have over two glasses of wine. Mm -hmm. So I think if I had abused wine intake, I'd probably have a a dynamic blood sugar crash and then a a compensating blood sugar spike. Um, But, you know, this was like a meal while preparing, excuse me, a glass while preparing the meal and then a glass after. Exactly. Um, It is important always to note, of course, with alcohol and ketosis that when you consume alcohol, of course, the liver prioritizes detoxification. And so then the liver is not as efficient as converting fat into fuel. So ketone production can get hindered. And then you can have that gluconeogenesis or that blood sugar response if your blood sugar does go low and you don't have presence of those ketones as fuel. So there can be some of that influence for sure to be mindful of. Now with alcohol consumption, anytime I'm having over a glass of wine, which I guess per this period of time, it looks like most of the times, (laughs) like I said, this is real life, not filtering it. Um, I added it to my goal. So we will do some alcohol free evenings for sure and be weaning down on the wine. But anytime I'm going to have over a glass of anything, I'm going to take a reset, restore, renew detox pack at bed. And, you know, this is going to support that phase two encapsulation excretion. It supports the function of the liver and the kidneys. And so it is going to aid in that filtration process to reduce the insult, if you will, of the alcohol or the toxic impact of the alcohol. And then downstream that does aid in supporting maintenance of ketosis, you know, not having that blood sugar liver dance of that glycemic spike or crash when the liver is distracted with the detox process. So I do find the Reset, Restore, Renew detox packs to be a great tool to help to offset that alcohol consumption and the metabolic influence. Um, I want to share one more day because this is the one that really had a high resonation with me um, and where I went the highest. So this was the 20th of August. And I woke up with a fasted blood sugar of 93. Um, Let's see, I had fat-fueled cold brew uh, where I just put heavy whipping cream in my cold brew and my blood sugar was at 87 at that time. Postprandial of that kind of hung into the 90s as clinic started. 
And then my meal one on that day was two eggs, one siete tortilla, half an avocado and hot sauce. And my blood sugar was at 90 at that time. That was at 11.34 a.m. Then I went two hours postprandial to 95, so a one-point variance. And I didn't peak in between. The one hour was actually from the 92 to 94, and then it hit 95. So really no influx, I would say. Then I cascaded down during my part of my clinic day, uh, like in the high 80s down to 82. And at that time, I had a matcha latte. I could feel epinephrine on that day. And so I told Brady, I messaged him, and I was like, can you make me a midday matcha? Um, Because I wanted a little bit more L-theanine to help to kind of mellow out my hustle. I have notes that say, matcha latte, stressful day in clinic, crunching, feeling epinephrine surge. And so it's interesting because right when he made me that, I was at a blood sugar of 81.5. And then it went up to 143. And I know that that did not have to do with the matcha consumption, that it had to do with the stress response because that was already happening. And I had that same composition of that matcha with negligible impact on my blood sugar. So I went up to 143 at 445. I had just crushed and finalized my chart notes. Um, I see clients from 8 a.m. until like 3 p.m. And so that 4.45, I know that I had just finished clinic. And then I made a note that I exercised. I said, walking at 3.50, phone call with friend. Um, and then I have noted at 4.40, started talking about pandemic. Mm. <laughs> and my blood sugar was the highest at uh, 4.45. So I think that I kind of busted out of clinic and phoned a friend to like process that stress. And um, I was also physiologically moving my body, but I have been walking at other times where walking just lowered or maintained my blood sugar. So I really think that that was that epinephrine surge. And then the rest of that evening, when I calmed down, I ended up taking CBD when I got back because I saw the high. I was like, mm-hmm. oh gosh, how can I harness this train? I chewed a GABA calm. And then um, I hung in the 70s and 80s the rest of that evening. And that dinner meal um, didn't even impact my blood sugar uh, metabolism at all. Super interesting that that was that the highest number that you got the entire the entire time at one forty three. Yeah, one okay. one forty three, and then I got another one at like one forty or one forty one. That mm-hmm. it was more stress related and and definitely not food related at all. Even when I had the milkshake and the <laughs> French fries. Oh my gosh. <laughs> no, it was a, and, and again, I don't take that as permission slip because I will say right. like that following day, I mean, my, my, my bowel movement wasn't ideal mm-hmm. and I felt bloated and, um, you know, I, I didn't feel as awesome as when I eat optimal, clean paleo keto, but it was just so remarkable to see because I talk about the impact of blood sugar Um, and stress connection but seeing that like I don't think that that would be a time that I would during the day be like oh I'm going to check my glucose levels Mm -hmm. Um, and I can physiologically the two highs that went over the 130s again the highest aside from stress was 129 with that milkshake and french fry episode and then aside from that I had a 143 and a 140 and those were only from mental stress so interesting. So like eating French fries and a milkshake in a relaxed state, you know, right in bed um, and hanging out, chilling with your husband, totally different response. Yes. yes. Um, let's talk a little bit on just glycemic variability or kind of swings in your glucose and what you saw in that area. Yeah. So that's something that I think is really easy to regulate when you are making ketones because again you're not dealing with this on off of blood sugar dumping when you are fasting and not eating and so they give this standard deviation within the NutriSense meter Um, and basically what they're looking at is the variance of like your pre-meal and then your post-meal so even if you are in a postprandial range of like, let's say, you know, 120s or whatnot, if pre-meal you were at 65, that's still a huge variance, you know, almost doubling that value. So that would still be a swing that could be dramatic to your system. Um, So they state that the standard deviation should be less than 20 to be good, less than 14 to be ideal. And so when I went into my overall analytics, my standard deviation was scored at 14, which is in that ideal range. And 100% again, if the blood sugar levels were in the ideal range with zero spikes per day. Super interesting. So not a lot of variation. Again, and although I would pick up those spikes at the 140, Mm -hmm. you know, 
three and the 141 or whatever, give a couple points here or there as being out of the range concerning, but um, they didn't pick up on that. Okay. So very cool. Um, Beyond fasting, blood sugar, post meal, and kind of the variability, obviously we talked about the stress trend as kind of the biggest thing. Any other aha moments or um, things that you did to kind of rein things in when you started to notice that impact? Well, I did notice that, like I said, the evening calm and clear regimen that had fallen out um, definitely helped to start to bring down those fasting blood sugar levels. So that was an important connection to the stress cortisol. And I attribute that to the ingredient phosphatidylserine in the calm and clear and the extra L-theanine in there. Um, I noticed on the first time I had a stress surge, which was actually a 141, um, I didn't take calm and clear that day at all. Uh, Brady and I share one of the bottles and then I have one in clinic and I don't know, I just got in my day and I took my, uh, fasted supplements and my midday and, and somehow I didn't get my calm and clear in. And I did notice Brady was like, you're a little bitey today. And I had that like lying in the cage adrenaline mm-hmm. response. And of course, when I looked at my meter, then I saw that 141 and I was like, oh, that's what that is. So uh, then I was really regimen the rest of the, the time uh, doing this meter tracking with my calm and clear. But I also realized that there were some times, especially if I could anticipate like six patients in clinic or something big going on that I needed to influx even further, more of like the seven to nine calm and clear versus my standard six, which I had been doing during the peak of pandemic stress, but I just kind of got in the rhythm of maybe that's the the frog in the hot pot, Becky. It's like mm-hmm. you like normalize your stress response and then you're like, oh, well, like this isn't that stressful. <laughs> right. Compared right. to pulling my eyebrows out, you know, like mm-hmm. I'm not so stressed now. So I think I, I, I kind of normalized the stress threshold. And now I am back on that seven to nine a day of the calm and clear and more regular use of GABA calm. And when I did that, then my clinic days were peaking at 106. So very different data when, like I preach, I was bubble wrapping in a different way. The whole time I've been really consistent with the adaptogen boost. Um, So that one I've been keeping at three a day the whole time. It was really the influx of calm and clear and GABA calm. And I will say also what I did is I moved the um, CBD oil, which had been in my kind of like coffee making station and brought that in my clinic. Mm -hmm. And now I've also been doing about 30 to 50 milligrams of CBD right when my clinic starts. So on clinic days, I'm layering that in. And when I started doing that in conjunction with the GABA Calm and the Calm and Clear, then my peaks were like a 35 point variance, which is very significant. Totally. So even you need a reminder sometimes on, on some of these tools, if you will. And I think putting them in front of you on your desk is, is a lot of, you know, a lot of that battle is just having it right there where there's no excuse not to take them. Yeah. Like everything, right? I always am telling my clients, like if you're not taking your probiotic because in there, you're in the refrigerator first thing, do you know that all of our probiotics yeah. are stable at temperatures under 120, what was well, something like that? 100... 144, I want to say. Well, yeah. Wait, well, no, one. 120 something. 20, yeah. 124, 122. It's 122. I think it's 122. Mm-hmm. 144 was your blood sugar. Number. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, all of our probiotics are stable upwards of 122. Yes, I'm very confident that that's the number yep, that's now that it. we're saying it. And um, so I'm always saying, oh no, like you have to just take your probiotic and put it on your vanity mm-hmm. for consistency. And so it's the same thing about anything. If it's a stress responding formula and it's in your office, at it's not in your office and you work in your office with your door closed and you know that you're not going to pause for self-care to go into your bedroom to grab that, you need to put an extra bottle in your office or put yep. a pill pack or um, you know a dish that you put out with some of those formulas to keep you on track. Totally. Removing the barrier. <laughs> yes. Yep. Yes. Um, let's take a quick pause for a very timely word from our sponsor for this episode, NutriSense. Yes. So uh, NutriSense provides, of course, continuous glucose monitor programs that provide you with real-time glucose data. Every sensor lasts 14 days, and they provide you a app that you can use on your phone that helps you to combine and visualize your glucose data with your daily activities, as I'm mentioning. So you get to look at these really cool trends and graphs that can influence your impact of sleep, stress, exercise, and food. And they have a really cool, engaging team that provides personalized recommendations on how you can improve your health. 
So NutriSense completely takes out the guesswork from the equation since you get to see your personalized response to food, stress, exercise, sleep, instead of a generic recommendation. As I mentioned, I also love the fact that a CGM can provide you continuous information versus cherry picking so that you're not cheating your own self, only testing when you think you're eating within the lines or only testing when you think you're distressing because there could be so many variables that you're overlooking without this continued monetization. Uh, you can purchase the CGM by visiting NutriSense.io. So that's N-U-T-R-I-S-E-N-S-E dot I-O. That's the website URL that you will go to. And there's several dip- different options that you can select based on the time commitment. You can use the code ALLYRD. So that's just A-L-I-R-D. And this will give you $30 off a monthly subscription plan. And this is a great way for you to see with accountability ability how you can get your first level of information then make some tweaks and adjustments and do it again and see if your modifications have resolved clinical outcomes super cool and let's talk maybe about how NutriSense kind of cuts out the the middleman and some of the work that you would have to do otherwise because i know getting a cgm otherwise would require a prescription Most definitely. So that's what's a really cool workaround. Um, You are able to do direct to consumer uh, by going over to NutriSense.io and you don't have to get a prescription from your doctor. They actually take care of all that work for you. So they actually fill a script for you, fill that at, you know, a pharmacy and then direct ship that. So it's just like you're buying something as easy as a purchase on Amazon. (laughs) Um, It's really awesome. And then it gives you that medical autonomy of your information um, that you're able to use to best support your wellness goals. So yeah, it it basically takes out the middleman and is like a direct to consumer purchase, no drama, no need for a diagnosis and um, really streamlines the process to empower you with information of how your blood sugar levels are controlled by your lifestyle. So I encourage you guys, check it out, go over to NutriSense.io and use the code ALLYRD on their website when you check out to get that discount. So cool. And there's so many clients that I'm thinking of right now that I feel like this could benefit. So I'm super excited to have this tool at our fingertips. Yes. Um, All right. So beyond putting it on and then tracking in your app, let's dig in a little bit more on just kind of the process and how you actually use it, how often you have to scan. Yes. So um, they do collect every 15 minutes of increments information on your CGM device, and they'll capture the last eight hours of data. So it's recommended that you, you know, at least physically scan the device every eight hours. So like first thing at rise is a good ritual to scan. And then sometime in the middle of your afternoon and then scanning again at bed. Um, I will say that there were some times that I did have a downtime. Um, if I was in bed for more than eight hours, which ain't no shame in that game. Um, I was proud of myself if that mm-hmm. happened. Um, so, you know, I would scan sometimes that maybe like, let's say 10 45. And then if I didn't, uh, get up until, you know, I guess that that would expel at like a 3 a.m. window. Where am I? 11, 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 a.m. And if I stayed in bed until 7.45, I would have a little hour and 45 minute dip where there just wouldn't be data collected. Um, so, you know, that's something to be mindful of. They recommend scanning before um, any dynamic times as well. Like every time you eat a meal, I probably scanned on average like six times a day. Mm-hmm. And so I tried to, once I saw that there was that down window, I tried to really make sure my true before falling asleep. So not like plugging my phone in. I try to keep my phone away from my nightstand um, just because of the idea of both removing an EMF device that's pulling Wi-Fi signal, but also the idea of the temptation of scrolling and screening sure. late at yep. night. Um, but I did make that habit change for best use of the meter where I was really scanning like before I'd actually fall asleep and then that'd catch like that 11.45 or, or you know 12 a.m. kind of scan. Okay. And that's something you could you know set alarms for yourself if that sounds like it would be difficult to do. But I think at least at first having this, it's, it's enough. You want the data that it's, you're interested to, yeah, like to I, scan it. Like I said, I was scanning sometimes like eight times a day, like broop, even though, you know, I, I was like, well, maybe it'll just be more accurate if I'm updating it again. Um, and it is, it's like, you want the real time data of like, oh, I'm eating this, this breakfast taco on the almond flour tortilla. How is that? And, oh, I'm going to go for a walk. I'm going to scan before and mm-hmm. after my walk. Um, so although it is continuously tracking, it is nice to 
to kind of get that like re-updated scan marker. And then that's usually a time that you're entering a data point um, of either noting like an exercise or no. So you kind of have your hand in your, your phone in your hand anyway. And so you just kind of swoop it over and it's way easier than finger sticking oh, yeah. at all those times of curiosity. Yep. You have to go and get the little lancet thing and bust yeah. all of that out and then you're bleeding. Build so up not your fun. courage. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Oh my gosh. Um, and then what about the actual process of entering the data? So is it just kind of a freestyle journal entry or would it be more akin to like a my fitness pal where you're selecting types of foods? Oh yeah, that's a great question. So they have sections when you go into add, there's like a plus button and so you can push scan and then that's what um, activates your sensor to scan. Uh, there's meal, activity, note, measurement, and message. Um, and so you can, you know, message the company actually and their dietitian on staff. If you're like, what's going on here? What could this be? And then they can help you troubleshoot, which cool. is pretty cool. Okay. Yeah. And then activity, like you can choose exercise type. You can make notes on it. So I would select, let's say walking, but then I might note had high stress day at clinic so I could have a variable from walking without noting the stress maybe on a Sunday or something like that Um, and then the meal yeah you can select actually totally app style by adding ingredients Um, I ended up just typing in and doing a description but sometimes you can also add a picture of your Mm -hmm. meal so that's pretty cool too so you can add plus and take a, a picture with your camera on your phone and that will really help you if you're dealing with blood sugar dysregulation and postprandial then you could really nerd out on your macros Okay, so safe to say, um, biggest trend for you was stress, like we've harped on. Wah, wah. Um, <laughs> we knew that. We knew that was going to happen. Um, but even then, your average blood glucose overall was 85, 0% spikes in a day. Um, so I think that speaks to some really solid resilience and, and really good management overall of blood glucose. Um, what are you taking away from this experience that you're going to build in? I know you mentioned the common clear and Gabacom is kind of a more, you know, uh, front and center tool, but what else will you be taking away? What else are you implementing? Yeah. So, um, you know, just really ensuring that I'm tight on all my stress support formulas, which again, you know, the relax and regulate, um, instead of doing the 1.5 scoops, getting a little bit more aggressive into the two scoop world, especially if I anticipate, um, like a higher stressful sleep night, um, of like a, a, a early call in the morning or a big meeting or something like that. So I'm being a little bit more liberal there. Like I said, I shifted instead of six a day, I'm at the seven to nine, still the calm and clear. So I said, okay to myself, keep going. Um, and then I also have been really consistent this whole time through with the bio C plus. And, um, as I mentioned earlier in prior podcasts, I removed the, um, adrenal support when I saw that my cortisol was at Mm -hmm. a adrenal stage zero and my epinephrine was off the charts. So you have to also watch what am I using as a stimulant and where I can pull back there. And I also had a big aha that I am committing to, uh, three days a week. I got really on the cold brew train, Becky. I was about to ask you. It happens every summer. (laughs) We just had some this morning. I know. (laughs) Well, I just got this raw, um, A2, uh, milk and I mean, there's just nothing like some cold brew, like, like some, it's just like coffee spiked milk, really. Yeah. <laughs> Delicious. <laughs> but I will say I'm going to commit to three to four days a week of, of coffee free and do tea instead. I know that I'm much less reactive on the epinephrine level. And if I must do coffee, which you did see me do as a testament, um, I'm, I'm doing the CBD oil mm-hmm. as a, as a confirmed guarantee because I was not doing that. I had totally fallen off CBD oil. And now anytime I have coffee, I'm definitely using, like I said, 30 to 50 milligrams, um, to ensure that I'm mitigating that fight or flight stress response. Um, I also have been playing a little bit with my probiotics. And so I've been doing targeted strength and rebuild spectrum ongoing for like ever. And now I'm pulling back the rebuild spectrum to every other day and keeping the targeted strength daily. And that's been feeling really good in my enteric nervous system. Um, so, you know, sometimes we over probiotic and sometimes we have to pulse back there a little bit. And I think lifestyle wise, I've really been focusing on, trying to harness with the continued movement. Um, it's gotten so hot in Texas that we are in like our hibernation mode. We've hit triple digits in mm-hmm. August 
and you know this will be coming out later so hopefully by the time this releases i'm walking again my everyday 10,000 steps but i will say to be frank um there were some days within my cgm experiment that i was only walking like 2,000 steps so it was just like passive um and maybe just like with stella on her bicycle three blocks and then just walking in my house doing stairs and laundry and such um so that's another goal that i'm setting is getting my walking back up to an average of 10,000 steps a day because i know it's not just the physical activity of getting the glucose into my muscle it's actually the parasympathetic regulation function of my body feeling safe and getting that kind of rhythmic foot pattern on the pavement um, allowing my breath patterns to release and um, I've been really consistent with the yoga and dance and I think that's the thing that's keeping me knit together yep. thank god uh, but the walking is one that I want to commit to and we, we were on a good run where I had been doing more green space walking. Like if I was going to do it, I was going to go to Zilker Park or, um, you know, walk around Barton Springs or something like that. And that feels also more parasympathetic, like bathing in nature Mm -hmm. and getting that grounding effect as well. And so I really want to commit to that. Um, And then the last thing I'll say in the mental space is affirmations. Um, So I've been having so much fun with Stella. Stella's really into playing school recently. So when she gets out of school, then she wants to play school. (laughs) And I have to be the teacher or the student or the new kid. And um, we always do this ritual where every day she starts with three affirmations. And so I've been doing that with her. And the affirmation I'm really working on is I am present Um, because I think just like I've shared with you guys in, um, episodes on stress and amygdala, the part of the brain that is that kind of more primal reactive survival, I think there's just still so much information coming at us. And I, um, realized also the same week that I had my CGM is when I did cupping Mm -hmm. for the first time, Mm -hmm. um, in a couple years, honestly, I think I haven't done cupping since pre-Stella, so probably five years. And um, the acupuncturist, when she did cupping on me, demonstrated two areas that were highly, had a lot of petechiae or a lot of um, held up, you know, um, a demonstration of stagnation in the lymph and needing oxygenation in the blood. And um, I had stopped seeing my chiropractor because he was mandating masking. And I have not been to the chiropractor since that mandate started in, I think, May or June. So I think that there definitely was some stress that wasn't being released from meridians or neurological system or some of that physiological impact, and that that definitely is playing a role. And so it's good to see this information in tangible quantitative data so that I have that accountability of getting my stress system back bubble wrapped. And um, I'm really applying affirmations with Stella as a proactive measure. And one that I'm working on is I am present. I just mentioned that. Um, So really in all of the methods and sense, and even Brady and I, we are working on phone free time because we're just having these, Mm. again, like where it's like, you know, 6 p.m. and and Stella's playing and we're just both like scrolling on our news feed. And it's like, no, (laughs) we need to go plug our phones in and be present. We need to be connected as a family. We need to reintegrate because this will get us into that parasympathetic restful state. Um, With the cupping, I saw that, uh, or what Cass, who's the acupuncturist, told me is that the two areas that were highest concern were my emotional heart, not my physiological heart, but my emotional heart and my emotional liver. And the emotional heart holds anxiety and it holds worry or concern for others, or one could say heartbreak, emotional heartbreak, and willingness to do anything to fix. And um, then the liver, which was the secondary impacted area, um, was my emotional liver where you hold anger. And again, at the time of this recording, this is a timestamp where back to school guidelines are going. And I I really feel like for those of you that have kids and know Frozen 2, the best way to describe where I feel emotionally is like Elsa trying to harness the ice horse. Like I'm like (laughs) throwing my hair back in that braid and like running into the waves and crashing and falling and doing it again. Getting knocked down. (laughs) Yeah, getting knocked down and thrown back and thrown back. And so it totally all resonated. And I think it was really cool to see both the CGM and the cupping in this same, you know, two week window of experience because it's helped me to take pause and recalibrate on an emotional energetic level as well as a a physiological and mental commitment to myself and wellness yes such a good kind of reminder to walk the walk and and you know these are all tools that i'm sure that you know we've been sharing on the podcast and sharing in clinic with 
clients dealing with this stuff, but sometimes we need a little reminder or kind of kick in the pants to do it ourselves. Yeah. Yep. yep. Nothing like that objective data. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's like these things don't lie. Um, <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, let's talk maybe a little bit more on uh, Beyond Trends, just functionality with the meter. So we talked about kind of how it works, wasn't too painful. Um, what about any trends of like needing to recalibrate it? I know it takes a little time in the beginning to yeah. calibrate. Let's talk about accuracy. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, CGMs, um, and finger prick devices have the FDA clearance to have a 15% variation from what you would receive from a true full blood draw of a glucose serum draw of glucose, which is the most accurate. Um, so what you can do is look at a serum glucose level to calibrate or a glucose glucometer. Um, and so I did, uh, have a, a glucometer where I ran uh, blood tests on my finger prick, three of them in the first 24 or excuse me, first 48 hours of, of wearage. Cause it takes 24 hours for the meter to calibrate. And so in that first 48 hours, um, I did have to do a meter adjustment to get that back on track, um, consistently looking at my glucometer. So I definitely recommend if you're investing in this, that you do track with your glucometer and then you can just go into the settings and recalibrate that and then you can do another troubleshoot glucose test to ensure that it is on track like the following day and I did that and then it seemed very consistent throughout the rest of the time the only other time that it was falsely I believe elevated um, and this never was above what, what it was in stress was um, there was a period of time when I was in the pool when it, it zeroed out to 60 because because the meter got too the sensor got too hot okay and it's, it, again it's 105 in in Austin right yep. now so it, it's just like a, a device in the sense of like your cell phone or your computer will overheat and and not work. Um, so that did happen also twice during the 12 days of wearing, but I'm talking to you in triple digits and being outside in the sunshine for more than an hour's length of time, direct sun. Yep. So pretty, pretty resilient little meter yeah, um, most, for the most part. Most definitely. And it lasted the full 12 days. Like the adhesive wasn't peeling off or anything like that. Yeah. Not all, not at all. I had to pull it off myself. I know, um, I watched. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which also wasn't bad. I was more scared of doing yep. it than anything. Um, the adhesive is, is the part to get out. Not that the needle doesn't like mm -hmm. hook or anything. Um, and I did pull it off, uh, two days earlier because I had another a, a event with photos and then also was swimming that next day. And I was like, I don't want to fake swim with this. So yeah. I, I was done. Yep. I felt like I got all the information I needed. Yeah. 12 days solid, but you could have gone to the full. I believe 14, 14 for sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, let's just talk about who this would be maybe a beneficial tool for, or, or who you f foresee like in clinic recommending this to, cause I've got, I've got a running list in my head of clients for oh, sure. Oh, me too. I mean, <laughs> I think that this is such a great accountability measure because again, you can't cheat the system. Um, I really feel like, and like I said, I was really pushing the mechanism and, uh, really eating ad lib. Um, like I said, I had two low carb margs one day. I had a, a glass or two of wine most evenings and, and that's where I am right now in my lifestyle and I'm okay with that. <laughs> and I feel that that's a part of my balance of all the things. Um, but so I didn't cheat or navigate in any certain way, but I think the cool thing is for those that have like binge eating history or accountability concerns where they're two days on one day off, um, you know, just like we've seen with individuals that track their intake, um, they're going to be more accountable. They're going to eat maybe one low carb chocolate chip cookie instead of four, mm -hmm. or they're going to ensure that they are, um, you know, watching their timing of their intake, or they are getting those cups of leafy greens, or they are walking and getting their steps in. So I think the accountability is awesome. I think if you've ever struggled with weight loss or blood sugar balance, or you're someone who's dealing with hormone imbalance and adrenal stuff and you want to check in on your stress story. I think all of these areas of concern, so blood sugar metabolism, pre-diabetics, diabetics, weight loss, troubleshooting keto, adrenal fatigue, and anxiety, so much more because you can really nerd out with the data and it's the best way to explore and self-experiment. And then Becky and I would have so much fun with you guys as your practitioners to really help you troubleshoot and take it to the next level. Oh, totally. And, and, you know, like you said, the meter doesn't lie. So it's one of those things where like you could skip adding that second cookie in my fitness pal, if we're not being full on accountable. Um, but this really shows you that variation and also shows you areas even within that two weeks that you could 
tweak and make adjustments and see how you're, you know, do a couple days, no supplements, and then layer on your stress support um, and do a carb cycle within that and really play and kind of see what your variations look like. Yeah. I think that it's a great way to get that N equals one individualized approach. And, you know, that's what we really preach with our keto program and the idea of metabolic flexibility, this idea that everyone is completely biochemically unique. Um, We want to figure out and troubleshoot your Achilles heel, which mine is clearly still stress and anxiety. (laughs) And I think it will be forever. Um, But it would be interesting to see, you know, how bad it could get if I wasn't doing all these things. And I'm not going to do that to my body at this time. I I would probably unravel and (laughs) not be safe for human consumption. But, um, you know, I I truly and strongly believe that when I was able to mitigate and then during the clinic days only saw the 106, that I just need to give myself more permission to be more proactive and bubble wrap, just like I do for all of my clients. So really cool connections there. If you guys want to learn more about blood sugar metabolism, nutritional ketosis, metabolic flexibility, the stress blood sugar connection, keto for hormones, and so much more, this is the final opportunity that y'all have to join our 12-week food is medicine virtual keto class. This is the archived version, so it is 20% off, but if you sign up today or anytime this week and you're listening to this at live time when this releases early October, you do get the class materials through December 2nd and all of them are released now and you will still be catching my second live um, Q&A which helps you to navigate the materials. So go on over to AllieMillerRD.com, check that out backslash ketosis hyphen class. We'd love to have you join us this round otherwise we'll see you live in the new year and as always um, if you enjoyed this episode of the Naturally Nourished podcast go on over to wherever you're listening, leave us a five star review Share this episode with a family member or a friend that you think would benefit. And we appreciate you guys navigating your journey with us as one of your resources. Thank you for listening to the Naturally Nourished podcast. Visit our blog at AllieMillerRD.com for recipes, wellness tips, and food as medicine meal plans. Connect with Allie and Becky at AllieMillerRD on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Until next time, stay nourished and be well.